for me. Um, we welcome Andy Tompkinson from um, adept.com and battlebox.com. So, um, and Andy's going to really talk about putting business continuity management into some context um, so that we can all understand what do we do after we've evacuated, what happens after we've all got outside and we're in the car park, what happens then. So he's going to hopefully give us some, uh, well not hopefully, he will give us some simple um, tips around business continuity that it actually is what it says on the tin. We don't need to perhaps over it and drag us through this sort of mire of smoke and mirrors that seems to surround this black art of what is business continuity management and people like Andy make a good living out of it. Uh, maybe? Okay. So Andy is a consultant who delivers um, the business continuity and crisis incident management, disaster uh, recovery, emergency planning. Um, he was co-author of uh, Business Continuity for Dummies, and it just so happened I saw he's got a, he's got some here which he was autographing earlier on. I got one off him a, oh, about a year ago, and I can tell you they do fetch a pretty good price on eBay with his, his autograph on them, so they're, they're, they, they are quite worth having. Um, so Andy's a... Uh, um, he is uh, associate of the Emergency Planning College and he completed assignments for the Department of Education um, and he delivered a disaster recovery program and the Central Bank of Ireland in Dublin where he delivered a resilience by design assignment. He was contracted to KPMG in Qatar and delivered an exercise as a subcontractor for Qatar Petroleum. In 2012, and you make of this, what does it mean when we say somebody's a personality? You can judge that at the end of tonight. But he was voted in 2012 the Business Constituity Institute's Institute Personality of the Year. And he was nominated again in 2014. He worked on the London 2012 Olympics from March 2009 to October 2012. And he even performed in the closing ceremony. And I'll, I'm sure he will explain what he did for that. He's a retired gunner officer. He plays rugby for Fylde and he strums his ukulele at every opportunity. Now, whether we're going to get that treat tonight, we will find out. But we welcome Andy, and over to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nigel. Uh, because Nigel's got a copy of Business Countries for Dummies already, um, I've got two. I'm afraid they're not the rare unsigned versions. They're, they're already been signed. Uh, but anybody that comes up with a particularly good question or a particularly good answer, um, then they get to win. Um, not that I'm competitive at all. Um, they, they get to win. They get to win a copy of the book. And uh, we are going to be competitive tonight. So, um, so stand by. This is uh, I hope to be some audience participation. So you, you know a little bit about me. Um, I am a cheeky bugger. I am politically incorrect. And if I offend anybody, uh, it's certainly not by accident. <laughs> But, but I do see us, uh, I see us practitioners in health, I'm a Nibosh, but I did Nibosh when I retired from the army. I, I see us as brothers and sisters. I see us on the same team. I see anybody that does compliance, whether it's environmental or health and safety or information security or uh, business continuity. I see us all as brothers and sisters uh, as a call to arms to do the right thing. Uh, and doing the right thing isn't always the commercial thing and doing the right thing um, isn't always the politically, uh, the, 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 the cultural thing, um, and we have to stand up and be counted. So I, I see this audience as, as hard men and women that have got a tough job, and I have the utmost respect for you all. Now having said that, uh, for the rest of the time, I shall be completely disrespectful to you all. <laughs> so, uh, please, uh, please bear with me for that. Uh, now some of you, um, if, if you can, if you've got one of these near you, uh, you need to stand up, okay, and, and we'll, we'll start off with a bit of an exercise. So, so you're, looking, you're looking for one of these. <laughs> so this is, the, this is the gig, okay. Uh, you, you pass it to your colleague, all right, so you, sir. So you pass it to your colleague, okay, and the deal is you're not allowed to let go of the two ends, okay? 
so you have to pass it to your colleague, okay, they're the two ends. Now without letting go of the two ends, you've got them now, your objective is to tie a knot in the rope. Any questions? Okay, have a quick go. Anybody that can do it, then put your hands up and show me how you've done it. Have a quick go now. Pass it to your colleague, two hands. You're not allowed to let go of the two ends, but you have to put a knot in the rope. <laughs> there is there is method in my madness. Okay, take, take, take a seat. Okay. So, 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 just if you don't mind, just stand, stand side on. Okay, now pay careful attention to this trick. This is one for the kids at home. Without letting go with your two hands. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well done, thank you very much. We know, we know where the brains are in this operation now. Uh, so someone just said to me, what the hell's this got to do with business continuity? Good question. Uh, and, and I think it has got a lot to do with business continuity. I think it's got a lot to do with your job as well, to, to tell you the absolute truth, because we work in organisations that are entirely inflexible. That length of string represents the environment that you're in, and you can't change it. You can't change the length of it, the, the way it works, you cannot change that. It's very, very difficult to change a piece of string. But what you can do, and what business continuity practitioners have to do, is they have to change by crossing their arms in order to, in order to achieve the, the objective. And that's the point I really want to make. We're on the same side, and I want to be able to explain to you how you can take your health and safety um, expertise, get everybody safely out of a building and then in vac or, or inside a shelter in place, in evacuation or in vac evacuation, and then take the next step. And that next step is, is taking you a step into business continuity. And if we can all do that, then it's going to make everybody's life happier. But the trick is, is about making that change, is about us having to change, um, but the environment probably won't change at all. So, so we just have to be clever how we go about that. So, so that's why we've done that rope trick. It's a good one for the kids. Um, so people talk to me about resilience and they say, is resilience business continuity mark two? What's the difference between resilience and business continuity? Um, can anybody offer me up a, uh, an explanation? Resilience versus business continuity. Has anybody, has anybody heard of that debate? Oh, it's all gone quiet now. <laughs> Anybody? Mm -hmm. You haven't heard the debate or you just don't want to talk to me? <laughs> you, sir, thank you. Thank goodness for you. Uh, You're a brave man. Can I give you that? Good. Bridging my memory back a few years. I mean, I say resilience is the ability of an organisation to withstand uh, sudden unexpected changes. Whereas business continuity, I would describe more as the processes by which you actually ensure that you can continue your business should things go wrong. So um, I think there's two parts to resilience. There's the ability to absorb shock and bounce back. If we were resilient as a human being, so let's take uh, flu as a good example. You go to doctors, you get a flu jab. That makes you more resilient to the flu strain, less likely to catch flu. But even if you do catch flu as the residual risk after you've had the inoculation, then you bounce back as your business continuity. So that's really how I would explain it to everybody. I don't think resilience is Mark II business continuity. It's not really anything any more different than Noah's Ark, Mark I, uh, 300 million BC. Um, you know, it's really, I think business continuity is really obvious but people turn it into smoking mirrors, they keep inventing new terms. I think they do that a bit in health and safety, I don't know if you would agree. Um, and actually, it's a really, really simple subject. So, the element of risk 
um, hasn't always had much attention in business continuity because it's always been about the bouncing back. But, but I'm a protagonist of risk is really important in order to target harden so that you've had your inoculation, it's much easier then to bounce back in a quicker time than it would have been if you, if you didn't have your, um, if you didn't have your inoculation or if you didn't take risk management seriously. So risk management in business continuity has always been there, but I think now with resilience, it's, it's got more emphasis and that's a good, that's a good thing. Now, I guess that's, uh, I guess that's my first copy of the book, isn't it? I'll swap you for that microphone, can't say further than that. Thank you. There are a few rare unsigned um, copies, but there's one for you. Now that should give everybody a bit of enthusiasm to answer my questions. Because <laughs> I've only got one of these babies left. Um, but we'll see how we go with the exercise in a minute. Um, so I would say that business continuity is, is around rapid results and quick wins. There's a chapter on that in the book. Uh, that's, I'm the co-author, I didn't write the whole thing, but I wrote that chapter. I think it's really important that we do the easy things quickly. And one of the easy things that we can do is every time we do an evacuation or an evacuation, we just bolt on a bit of business continuity to that. So that when we all get outside and we're safe, and we're accounted for, then someone can ask the question, what do we do next? Well, what we do next is our emergency response, our instant management, our business continuity and IT disaster recovery, and that's what we do next. So that's really what I want to tell you about. <coughs> the seven Ps really are how to do that business continuity piece, because there is something around the people, meaning skills, succession planning, uh, uh, having second 11s, having deputies and, and alternative people, having premises that you can move from one place to another so it's, a, it's as much about uh, displacement as it is about relocation and different processes providers mean in the supply chain not just to hang your hat on one single source supplier but to have a variety of suppliers or have reserves in the system so that you've got your consumables depending on if you're a manufacturing organization if you're a retailer publicity meaning communications public infrastructure meaning if all the mummies have got to stay at home because the teachers have gone on strike and the kids can't go to school, well, that's a big public infrastructure issue. So you as a business may be affected by something actually like a teacher strike because you have a high proportion of mums and dads that are looking after younger children and they can't come to work because they've got to look after the kids because the teachers are on strike. Mm -hmm. So public infrastructure is important and, uh, and phone numbers naturally enough so that you know who to call Ghostbusters. Have a quick chat about risk then. I want to concentrate on that and, and we'll do a, bit of ex uh, do a bit of an exercise in a second. Risk has really changed in standards. So you know you're 18,001. Hands up if you've come across 18,001. Well, I would expect that to be everybody. Uh, you know that's going to change. So come the rewrite, um, they're going to take things like um, preventative, preventive actions out and it will all be corrective actions and the preventive actions will form part of the risk assessment and it will be much more heavy on corporate risk assessment and corporate risk appetite than it's been before and that's not just for 18,000 that's for all the standards for the business continuity standard ISO 22301 I'm going to read out a list of standards shout out a standard 9001 9001 quality so that's changing right now and it's got risk in it which it didn't have before anybody else 14,000, exactly, so it's not up for rewrite yet, but when it does come, it will follow the same as quality, as business continuity, information security, anybody know that one? 27,000, very good, do you want a book? <laughs> I, mean, I, can't, I can't give it, that's, that's too easy, it's too easy, it's, too easy. it's not worth a book. Uh, no, you get another one right, you get a book, I can't say further than that. Uh, absolutely, 27,000 was already rewritten in, in 2013 and that has got the bit on risk in it. So risk is definitely the flavour of the month for standards and I think it makes a lot of sense that you look at an organisational risk appetite. So let's do this then, let's do this thing. This is you over on the right hand side, okay, you make widgets in the factory. You make 100 widgets a day, okay, it costs you one drongo to make one widget. You take the widgets down to the port of embarkation and you've got five ships that you can transport your 100 widgets across every day. 
it costs you one drongo to transport your widget. So it's one widget to make it, one widget, sorry, one drongo to make a widget, one drongo to transport a widget, and when you get to the other side of the sea, you can sell them for 10 drongos per widget that you get there. Now your job as risk managers is to present back to the board, the managing director, that's me, uh, why you've chosen to distribute your cargo of widgets on as many ships. So you've got five ships, the ships are identical. You just need to choose if you put one widget on one ship and 99 widgets on another ship, or 20, 20, 20, 20, 20 across all five, or put them all on one, or split them 50, 50 on two ships. So you have to decide how you distribute your widgets on the ships. The downside is one ship will sink every day, every crossing. Okay, now your job is to get the maximum profit. So you have to do a quick calculation and then come back to me. Uh, uh, you've got the length of it as long as it takes me to play I'm the King of the Springers on my, on my ukulele uh, <laughs> to be able to come up with a calculated answer on this. Is that alright? Can I ask a question? Yes, you may. Well, if you only use four ships, would the cost be stronger than transporting a cheaper one? No, 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 it's, it's the cost uh, is one drongo per widget. But you're, you're transporting 100 widgets every day. Yeah. So it's going to cost you 100 drongos. To, so one widget equals one drongo to transport yeah. it. So you're going, to put 100, you're going to put 100 widgets on four ships, or 100 widgets on one ship, or 100 widgets <coughs> across three ships, or 25, 25, 25, 25. You still pay one drongo per widget to transport it on the ship. <laughs> it's a terrible contract. It is. You can buy insurance if you want. Okay, it costs you, it costs you a drongo per widget. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Does everybody, does everybody understand what they've got to do? Because I'm coming into the audience after this. Once you, so you need to calculate out what the best answer is. Yes, sir? Do you always have five ships? In other words, you say one sinks every day. Yeah, so the following day they get an identical ship with the same crew, they all same, sail at the same time. You can't transfer cargoes across as one ship is sinking. You just need to do a calculation on risk to tell me what is the best way of distributing your widgets on those five ships, or one ship. Yeah, well, sure. Well, my point is on day five, we've still got five ships, only one ship. No, no, every day you get five ships. So it doesn't matter if you do it on one day or if you split it out for a week. It's the same deal every day. Yeah, I am. Uh, uh, you wait till I get my ukulele out. <laughs> then, then I'll ask you that question. Spread it out. If you've got 100 on one ship, yes. that's you that ship can. Three ship that goes down that day, though. It, it could be, but you've got an 80% chance that it's not because it's much more likely that one of the other ships will sink. But if you don't put any products on them, there's no reason they're sailing in the first place. No, they're all sailing. All five sail every day. Sail anyway. Okay. Stop, and that's what's bothering me. Yes. I want to be a man, man cup. 
I'd stroll right into town And be just like them other men I'm tired of monkeying around Oh, shooby do. I wanna be like you I wanna talk like you Walk like you Okay, no, 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 there's more later, so you, you really want to be careful. Okay, who, where's the mic? Who's got an answer? You put them all on one ship? Oh, you put me off singing your... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who's done it? We, yes, madam. Oh, you, oh you're, not, you're not the book lady. <laughs> What you got? Okay, so well, if you look at the two extremes, the two extremes are that you put 100% on one ship, or that you put 20% on uh, the other extreme, 20% on each of the ships. Over a long enough period of time, the result is the same because uh, if you put 100% on one ship, then 20% of the time you're going to lose 100% of your goods. So over a longer period of time, it will amount to losing 20%. Whereas if you spread it out, 100% of the time you're going to lose 20% of your goods. So over a long period of time it's going to amount to the same. But the difference is, one of them is a much more known risk, because you know you're going to lose 20% every day, and you can count that into your costings. Whereas the other one, putting the 100% on one ship, is an unknown risk. So your variation is much greater if you put all of them on one ship, or some very common So what's the answer? <laughs> <laughs> what's, the I know. what's the question I know. again? I know, well, that. what's the best? Well, then, then it, it's Why don't you put 25 on four ships? So that then you have a chance that if the ship that's got no widgets on sinks, over a long you still get 100%. Over a long enough period of time, the maths would come out that you would still always lose, that over a long period of time, you still lose 20% of but, your goods. But what about today? We're doing this for one day. Well, you're, you're not there because you said, you, you said it's the same ships every day. I know it's the same ships every day, but, but we'll do this for one day. Well, so what's your decision? Okay, I'm going to go for the known risk. Listen, I'm the managing director of this company. When I say to the risk manager, you need to make a calculation, present it back. I'll go for the known risk. I want decisions, I want solutions, not problems. No, I'm going to have the known risk of 20% on each ship then. You're going to put 20%, so that means that I will definitely lose 20 at least I, widgets at least I was every right. day. At least I was right. You were right. <laughs> well, that remains to be said. Has anybody got a different answer? Sorry, sorry, run that past me again. 50. 50? Yeah. 30. 30? Yeah. 10. 10? 10. 10. 0. 0? Yeah. And so, how can you guarantee, what, what profit can you guarantee? Uh, 50. So you're definitely, definitely, definitely going to get 50 widgets, aren't you, every single time? Or 100. But you might, if the ship that has zero on is the one that sinks, yeah. and you've got a 20% chance of that, yeah. haven't you? Then, then you win because you get 100% across. Yeah. But you're always going to get 50, because the worst case is the one ship with 50, yeah. so it depends, you always get 50 across. It depends how, uh, how risk averse you are. It depends how risk averse you are. So, very good answer. So, has anybody else got any other ideas that they want to, yes sir? Our one was uh, to split it. Our idea was to split it five ways, twenty five in ways. each, and insure it so we get seventy percent every day. And insure it. Yeah. I mean, insurance is always a good thing, but you need to watch out for what the premium is and then and then what 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 the we, cover is. We, we also costed a breach, but that's the, the next one. That's all the time. Very good. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Two ships 70 and 33 percent in the other three, so you have two chances of two ships that they can sink, but still you get the 100 percent or 99 percent. And if one of them sinks, it's 33 percent, so you, you have the other 66 every time, so you don't lose more than 33 percent. You could never lose more than 33, but you could win 100 and you got a 60 percent, so you've got a 60 percent chance. Yeah of getting 100 across, a 40% chance of losing 33 widgets. It doesn't sound like bad odds. Is that a better odds or worse odds than splitting it over two ships? 50-50. The thing is 50-50, you can lose 50%. Yeah. And in this way, you cannot lose 50%, you only lose 33%. Uh-huh. Therefore, I think it's better. Okay, thank you very much.
Right, one more. It's about managing the risk, and I want to know what the risk is. The only risk way I can do that is to split it 20 on each, so I know that I am going to lose 20. It's a known risk, I can manage that, it's part of my plan, and I know what I then have to do to mark up. It supports what the lady said first time around. So you're never going to take a gamble in business? Uh, I do, but uh, you're asking for a strategy. I've given you my strategy. Yeah, no, uh, so, so my point is, everybody is correct. Because this isn't about a calculation that comes out with the right answer. Because there is no calculation, because you are looking at the same risks. It's just like a roulette wheel. When you roll that uh, ball in the roulette wheel for red or black, I know there's a, a green square, just but work with me on this. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's a 50% chance every time it's gonna be red or black, but you might get 16 blacks at the same time and the 17th spin is still a 50% chance on red or black. And it's exactly the same here. What this is about, and this is what I'm trying to convince you, is in business continuity, we've changed a bit and because nowadays this is about risk appetite. It's about the managing director or the top management saying, we are risk averse and we will accept a loss of 20% every day and that's fine. And we want everybody to understand that and work within those parameters or we are prepared to take a gamble. We are prepared to take a punt. And in the risk appetite statement, it should really be saying what things we're prepared to take a punt on and what things we're prepared not to take any punt on at all. We want to be target hardened and we want to have a risk treatment plan and we want to do blah, 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 blah. Okay, so that's the point really I'm trying to make. So well done everybody for coming up with your answers. I think the calculation is largely irrelevant because it's all about subjectively what you think and whether or not you're prepared to take a risk and take a gamble in business or whether your top management are or whether you're risk adverse and you want to accept the risk and know where you are every day. The statement of applicability, which used to be in all the standards, is booted out now, so there's no more statement of, of, of applicability, because with the risk coming into the standards, it means that there is no, there is no, we're doing risk for this and not for the other. There is no, uh, there are no exceptions. It is a, it's all inclusive. So there's no statement of applicability, because everything is applicable, and there's no preventive actions anymore because they're, su they're succeeded now by corrective actions, which is after risk with the risk treatment has happened. And that's going to happen to you on 18,000. So back on to BCM, what I want to do really is just really try and show you the two halves uh, from a business continuity management system like a health and safety management system, like a enterprise risk management system, an information security management system. All these management systems now seems to be a buzzword. It's the way of doing things within the governance and the administration of a repeatable <coughs> process to make this to be able to do the same things consistently and get that plan do check act continuous improvement. You all know that from health and safety, right? And on the other side is actually what you do which is the bouncing back part of resilience. So the absorb shock part is in here on my risk assessment. And the bouncing back is what you do after the event, which is the business continuity. So that's where resilience comes together between the absorb shock and the bounce back. So a bit like Walt Disney, I'm going to do a bit, I've done a bit of, uh, uh, of animation on, on PowerPoint here. So we're going the two, the two halves of the same circle, the governance on the business continuity management system in blue on the left, and the capability, the plans and procedures that you use on the right. So you have an event, and ticking around the clock, we have our emergency response plan. So this really kicks in after our evacuation and evacuation, which is the bit that you, that, that you health and safety guys, have actually created and tested and, and, and everybody's drilled and practiced. <coughs> Once everybody is safe and accounted for inside and shelter in place or outside in the, in the assembly area muster point, then we kick in with our incident management plan. The point of the incident management plan is to stabilise the situation from getting, so it won't get any worse. So this is about dealing with the press because you know how the press will have a go at our reputation. How long have we got to deal with the press these days after an incident? How many, sorry sir? 
Seconds. Seconds. So I don't know if you saw the uh, the 777 Dreamliner crash. The person got out, uh, staggered across the runway, reached into their pocket, got their phone out, turned around, and started taking pictures of everybody else getting off the aircraft. Seconds after the incident, social media kicked in and reputations are on the line. So you don't have very long at all. For social media, everybody now is a journalist, is a citizen journalist, and things now are sent so quickly through the internet, they go viral so quickly. What did Tony Haywood say from BP after killing 11 people? Back. Sorry? I'd just like to get my life back. <laughs> like to get my life back. Um, the way to get your life back, for him actually, is to do this. And, and BP were pretty poor because they just didn't have the speed of response that they needed to have uh, for the Gulf of Mexico crisis. So that's a really good example of how not to do it. So incident management is about stabilising the situation to stop it from getting any worse. Once we've stabilised, then we can do our business continuity stuff. So remember I talked about the seven Ps, your people, premises, processes, providers, blah, blah, blah. So we're recovering back to an acceptable level that we've said beforehand. We not need everything, but we do need the things that are critical to a level that is acceptable to us all. And then once we've done that, then we can get everything back to business as usual. Now, this is the clever bit. Look, watch me go back. See how I did that? So now I'm on the other side. So this is nothing to do with the event. This is on a perfectly sunny day in London like today. And now I'm looking at the business continuity management system. So I'm looking at my BCM manual, like a health and safety manual. It's the go-to place to tell me how to do the activities that I need to do in business continuity. I have my policy signed off by the, the top management that says, well, hang on a minute, You're, you guys all got health and safety policy. What should the policy say? Any, any policy experts in the audience? What should you have in your health and safety policy that is the same as the Be business continuity policy? Yes, sir? I'm not dating. Aims and objectives? Statements. Yep, statements, yep. Yes, madam? Roles and responsibilities. Roles and responsibilities, yep. Anything else? Statement of intent, organisational arrangements. Statement of intent, organisational arrangements. Anybody else? The commitment. Stating the commitment, signing it off with a date. So no difference really between, that's why I think we're well aligned as brothers and sisters between health and safety and business continuity, because we're doing the same kind of thing, it's very similar. Business impact analysis and risk assessment. Uh, I don't know if anybody's come across this horrible term, MT pod, maximum tolerable period of disruption. Most of this is rubbish. Most of this is rubbish. It's in, been invented by people that have got nothing better to do uh, to come up with all of these different terms. What they mean is, how quickly have you got to do something? And what, the, what is the priority order? So if we've only got, I've got, four sam I've got one sandwich and I've got four hungry people, what do I do? I mean, they can all have a bite each of the sandwich, couldn't they? Or I could just eat it and say, sorry, all the sandwiches are gone. <laughs> or I could say, right, who needs a sandwich first? Well, I mean, why would you need the sandwich first? Because you miss breakfast. Yeah. You miss breakfast. Why do you need the sandwich first? Well you, well, you can't both have missed breakfast, unless there's something going on here, I don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, you haven't got any money, so you didn't eat last night. What about you? Why do you need the sandwich first? Because I cycled the 10 miles and I'm very, very hungry. You're very hungry because you've been exercising and you're a fit lad and you burn it off. Why do you need some? Because I'm pulling rank. Because you're the silly one, so you have it first, because you're the most... Okay, so they're all good reasons. So the whole point of the business impact analysis, to me, is you've only got a certain amount of resources, who gets them first? That's the BIA. If anybody tells you you need RTOs and empty pods and, and R, R, RFPs and PFOs and M, uh, what's the latest one? Minimum business continuity objective. Okay, do you know what? Please, respectfully. All it's about is who gets it first. Because once you know who gets it first, then everybody else says, okay, you're getting it because you're the highest rank, you don't get anything. And everybody knows, that's it, BIA done. 
Because once we've done the BIA, then we know who's getting the resources first. So the business continuity plan is all about giving the right resources to him first, and you lot get nothing. In fact, you lot probably are the resources that we're going to give to him, because that's where we're going to take resources internally that are available to us and give it to the, not the most important person, but the most time critical, the most urgent person first. That's BIA. Risk assessment then is about, so what do you do to target harden? So when we talked about resilience, the ability to absorb shock, target harden, bounce back, well that's what we do then to protect him. Maybe we put him on an intravenous drip so that he doesn't get so hungry all the time. Or maybe he has a packet of digestive biscuits in his pocket so that he doesn't get so hungry. So there are means of being able to use risk assessment and a risk treatment plan to alter the exposure in business continuity. And then this is really all the stuff that we need to do to make sure that it works. So we do some induction awareness, training, exercising, audit and review. And this is part of our plan to check out continuous improvement. To get back to business as usual. So that's governance on the left, plans on the right. If you think of it like that, I hope I've simplified it and not made it more difficult than it needs to be. Can you write emergency response plans and incident management plans without doing all the stuff on the left? No. I think yes. I really do think yes. Why wouldn't you? You've already written your evacuation or evacuation plan. You know what's going to happen in incident management. Someone's got to deal with HR and send staff home and make sure everybody's well looked after. Someone's got to deal with the press. Someone's got to deal with the technology. Someone's got to deal with the facilities, emergency services liaison officer. That's all same old, same old stuff. The only thing you need any analysis for is a business continuity plan because you need to decide who the resources get first. So actually, I think you can make big strides into business continuity by having the emergency response and incident management without having the analysis paralysis. When's a disaster a disaster? When it affects your business. Yeah, but I mean, you get those little links of a chain forming, don't you? So you can have something that, that's quite slow and that just gradually one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. Or you can get a smoking hole in the ground, which is quite obvious. So what I would suggest is that there is some kind of classification so that you know what the appropriate level of response is for business continuity. Because you don't want to be calling out the manager director of a multinational company because you've had a fire in the basement in your London office. So I think it needs to be appropriate. Uh, and sometimes we miss that point. And for you guys in health and safety, you're really close to this to be able to make categorization. And, and so I think that you are biggest friends, you and internal auditors probably are the biggest friends of, of business continuity practitioners. And you can, put some, you can put some measurements to this. And I think those measurements change, really. So we're talking about, you know, 500 million for a catastrophic event for a multinational corporation. But if we talk about the corner shop, 100 grand might put him out of business. You see where I'm going with that? So it's about what is appropriate. It's about what makes sense for your organisation. So I just want to go back to those, those seven Ps then and say, okay, what are we going to do? So that time scale at the bottom, going from left and right, this is when we have our disaster here. And then we do things really in a sequence. So we do our emergency response. So this is following your evacuation, evacuation. Then we do our instant management gold, silver, bronze. So top management, middle management, and the workforce, gold, silver, bronze. The gold team make their strategic decisions. The silver team take the, that direction and implement that by telling the bronze guys really what to do. It's integrated with everybody else around us, with our customers, with our suppliers, with the emergency services, with the press, with the families, with even with our competition, with our supply chain. And we do that through effective command control and communications. And incident management <coughs> has got to be quick because we're against the clock. Once we've stabilized it, now we're into our seven Ps to be able to recover or continue what we said is critical. How do we know it's critical? Says. Because we did the business impact analysis. <laughs> so we know what's critical. We already agreed it that he gets the sandwiches and nobody else does because we've done the business. So that's where the analysis comes in. 
to get back to business as usual in the fastest possible time. Okay, let's uh, let's get a job going here. So I need uh, I need uh, four volunteers from the back, four volunteers in the middle, and four volunteers in the front. So you can stand up, or I'm just going to nominate you. It's up to you. No, anybody standing up? Okay, so one, two, three, four, if you don't mind. So you're on this table, okay? You need to appoint a leader, and you need to tell me what your team name is, okay? So I need a team name and a leader. Okay, on this table here, uh, you sir, you sir, if you don't mind, would you like to do this? So one, two, three, one from this side. You up for this? Okay, so I need a team name and a leader for this table. And uh, at the front end, you have the four sandwich freaks. Okay, you four. Okay, so I need a team name and a leader. Right, at the back, what's your team name? Who's the leader? Who's the leader? What's your team name? Happiness. And who's your leader? Your own well done, thank you. <laughs> thank you, happiness. Misery. <laughs> misery. Well done, misery. And who's your leader? I'm the team leader, apparently. You're the team leader, very good. And your team name is? Risky Ricks. Risky Ricks, and your leader is? I've been nominated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is quite an easy exercise. You're against the clock and you're against each other. So it's competitive. There could even be a business contest for dummies at stake here for the winning team. Depend on how you get on. So, if you're the leader, okay, in a second, you're going to put your blindfold on, you're going to pick up your sugar tongs. Okay, blindfold on, sugar tongs on. If you're not the leader, then you're going to guide the leader to build the highest <laughs> dolly mixture <laughs> tower as you can build, okay? Now, the leader can't speak. And the team have to give the leader the orders, which is only up, down, forward, back, left, right, hold, drop. Okay? Are there any questions? I'll resign. <laughs> <laughs> Your resignation is not accepted. Oh. Uh, any more questions? Okay, are you ready? Do we have an unfair advantage by having this? Um, no, the work. string is <laughs> incidental to this, really. Uh, have you got enough room? So, okay. Starting from now. Um, go to the other end of the table. Down. Down. Go down. Go down. You're just moving them about, you're supposed to build them into a tower. Build into a tower. Go back. Sorry, where am I going? Tower. 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 Okay, now I can go forward, 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 go down. Okay, I, I can give you running commentary at the moment. One group has got one uh, one cube on top of the other, so they're up to two, one storey high. And everybody else is still on the ground floor. Okay, I can give you running commentary. There are two teams now that have got up to the first story, one on top of the other one. Okay. Why are we waiting? Yeah. 
And then after Harry, <laughs> ten seconds left. Oh, they've knocked it under. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, stop there. Let's have an inspection and see see where you are. So, so this team has got ground ground and first floor. This team have got ground floor. Uh, this team have got. You've had a disaster. <laughs> uh, you're one, one point five there. Precariously balanced. Um, who's got the mic? What? Uh, so what's this got to do with business continuity? Okay. Well, let, let's learn a few lessons. Then. I want to talk about leadership uh, before I finish. So, firstly, how do you feel as the leader? Confused but supported. Are you the right person to be the leader? Uh, with not able to speak, no. No. And should the leader be the person that does everything? No. No. And invariably in business continuity and invariably in health and safety, when you're doing exercises, the person in charge wants to do everything and actually that's not right. The person in charge needs just to be in charge and that's a job in itself. Okay, I'm moving on to the other team. Who wasn't a leader? How, how did you feel about the communications? I was one-sided. Was everybody talking at once, or was did you have one person one to person talk about? Talking. Oh, right. Well done. Did you agree that before? No. no. You did, that just, just idle. That, <laughs> 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 that's, that's a good reason. Did you do any? Did you do any planning beforehand? Did you say, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to build it and we're going to get three high? Did you think about that? What shape was it going to be? No. Did you know how long you had to do it? No. When I said, have you got any questions? Is much, you know Sir John Harvey Jones, you know Sir John yes. Harvey Jones? He was chairman of ICI, he, he has my best quote ever in business continuity. He says, planning is an unnatural process, which is why failure comes as a complete surprise instead of being preceded by a period of worry and depression. <laughs> <laughs> you could have asked me, you could have said, can we split these up? Because we only want to use the square ones, because the round ones are really hard to... I don't know if anybody works in construction in this thing. <laughs> the round ones are really hard to build. That's why bricks are square. Um, but I, I, still think you've done, I, still, I still think you've done a good job. Uh, what about risk management? What did you learn about risk management, this team in particular? <laughs> Sorry? It is, well, it is confusing. Every, you were, everybody was saying, right, right, right. And then you said, which way is right? <laughs> is it your right or is it my right? Which way is forward and which way is back? Well, it depends which way you look at it, doesn't it? Because you can look at it like this. Or you can look at it like that. Because if I'm here or I turn around here, well, that's my left side now. But if I turn around this way, then that's my left side, isn't it? Which is my right side. Well, that's my right side now. Unless I turn on this way, then that's my left side. That's what you got there. So, I think a big round of applause for everybody. And I think the dummies... Thank you very much. I think the dummies guide goes to uh, risk, Risky Riz. So, you have to share this amongst the, amongst the four of you. I've got a broken finger, so I can't... That's not, my ukulele, my ukulele player is not brilliant either because I've got a broken finger at the moment. So, so what's that got to do with, with business continuity? Well, leadership's really important for business continuity. It's a job in itself and it's really all about the planning and not about the doing. Although it is much more fun just to go and do something um, rather than plan it first. So, so if you're engaged with anything to do with business continuity, please, please, please sit back first, plan what you're going to do, then execute it rather than just go and do it. Because if you just go and do it, there's a high likelihood that it will wither on the vine. So just want to, to finally, you know, uh, Nigel said it to me, I'm trying to give you some context of business continuity. So the last thing I'd like to do is talk to you about a Rubik's Cube. Can everybody visualize in their mind's eye a nine by nine Rubik's Cube? Yeah, you got it in your head? Okay, so like Walt Disney and my animation skills, 
Uh, I've tried to have a go at that as well. So you know what I showed you on the previous slide? Gold, silver, bronze is really a triangle because you've only got a few bosses at the very top and you've got quite a lot of workforce at the bottom in bronze. But this is, I'm trying to show you this as a Rubik's Cube, okay? So, so try and help me out by understanding. We've got gold, silver, bronze. We've got that strategic level, tactical, operational level. And then if I turn the Rubik Cube round, I'm looking at another face now and I'm doing that integration piece. Internally, externally, and with the stakeholders and business partners I've got in my business. So I'm not doing this in isolation. And then I turn the Rubik Cube on its head and now I'm looking at the times. So I'm looking at the, the time of emergency response, the time of incident management, and the time of business continuity. And they come in sequential phases. So I'm trying to put that together now. So we've got dimension one, which is the hierarchy dimension. We've got dimension two, which is the integrating this with everybody else around us. And the dimension three, which is how it changes over time. And I'm just gonna try and build that up together. So there's our gold, silver, bronze in the emergency phase, in the incident management phase, in the business continuity phase and just build them up to make that Rubik's Cube. Now, if you can visualize that, and if you can explain that in that 10 seconds you get with the CEO in the lift as you go, now, how's health and safety going? What do you know about business continuity? This could well be your next job. Because yeah. compliance is everybody's, is everybody's own. There's a real emergence of convergence for all of these um, compliance type uh, activities. They're all coming together. So business continuity people are going to end up doing health and safety and you're both going to end up doing information security and environmental and 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 everybody's going to be doing enterprise risk management so this is the opportunity really to be able to explain there's really three there's really three dimensions of this there's a hierarchy dimension there's a not doing it in isolation and integrating this with everybody else and there's a sequence of things to do to to bounce back after the event and there's a risk management part which is not in the Rubik's Cube which is the bit you do before um, to target harden. As a summary then, do you remember we started off with a rope? You've got to change not the organisation. Chapter 3 in my book, quick wins and rapid results. I think it's a really good way of kick-starting things. Don't do the hardest thing first which is business impact analysis, do the easiest thing first which is the emergency response plan. You can do the emergency response plan without any analysis or policy or anything at all. Risk appetite is all pervading these days. Let common sense and simplicity prevail because if it's smoke and mirrors, nobody's gonna buy it. Leadership's really important and the planning part of leadership is really, really important. And you've got those three dimensions of business continuity. So I'd like to say thank you very much for inviting me today. Last time I was at Millwall with you, which was an interesting day, and I really appreciated it. Uh, and, and I very much enjoyed tonight and meeting you all. Thanks very much for your indulgence and playing along with me playing the games. Um, I hope you've learned something that you can take away. Thanks very much, Nigel. Thank you. Okay, we are happy to take some questions. I'm sure Andy 